Welcome to Crossroads. I'm your host, Joshua Phillip. Today we sit down in the Washington, D.C. office of Freedom Works with John Tamney. He's the director of the Center for Economic Freedom there, where I talk about his new book, They're Both Wrong, about his perspectives of how both sides of the political spectrum have their issues. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Remember to like and subscribe. Get started now. John, real pleasure having you on the show, and thanks for having us thanks here for at your office. Me. So they're both wrong. Hey, can you tell us about this. Well, they're both wrong in that both sides want to do policy. Uh, both sides have solutions. The richest man in the world today is, by most measures, Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, as he freely acknowledges just about everything he tries fails. Uh, Bill Gates, for the longest time, was the richest man in the world. His line was that nine out of 10 of his ideas during the Microsoft years failed. Now what's important is that when these brilliant entrepreneurs who have a good sense of the market uh, make a mistake, the, the pain is felt in Seattle. Uh, and I'm trying to make that point that politicians, precisely because they're, they're not laboring under market discipline, probably are more are prone to even bigger failures and that's why we want to leave policy to the cities and states rather than nationalize policy making that way if if they try something in santa monica california and it doesn't go, go well you feel it in santa monica not nationally and then if it goes very well maybe people mimic it but there should be more choice interesting and this is kind of a traditional american concept you were saying right yeah, there's, there's, I would argue that, that my, my underlying theme is not terribly original. Uh, let's bring choice back to politics. Let's people, let, allow people to basically choose their bliss, uh, choose how much, I'm not so much anti-government as I'm anti-national government. So leave the vast majority of taxing and spending to the cities and states and people can get their bliss. Uh, where I think the book is a lot more original is in showing uh, in terms of the deeply held beliefs by mo both sides, why there are so many holes in the arguments that both sides make. And so hopefully uh, people will get that out of it, plus they'll get this broad theme. From what I get, your main premise is that it's this idea that, you know, you, you oppose the socialism, of course, very strongly, but the conservatives also have elements of it in them themselves. And you argue this is more because they also believe in this form, these forms of interventionism this idea that they should not just oppose these policies but create their own counter policies which really in some ways aren't very good in themselves, at least as far as you're concerned. Is this accurate? It's, no, it's very, very accurate. Conservatives are rhetorically for limited government but their actions signal that they're not for limited government very much at all. Uh, one obvious example that, that people are probably very familiar with is, that, is uh, the Affordable Care Act. Some know it as Obamacare. And so when you think about it, once Donald Trump was elected, if Republicans or conservatives really wanted to just end it, all they had to do was vote for its repeal and put it on President Trump's desk the day he arrived in office. He would have signed it right there. But they didn't. Isn't it interesting that they didn't say we want to repeal it. They said they wanted to repeal and replace it. Well, wait a second. So what the Republicans were saying is that we don't like the Democrats' central plan, and so we're going to offer you our own. But why? And, and, and my answer always to this, or frequently what it is, is I've got, a, I've got a smartphone in my pocket. I've quite literally got this supercomputer sitting in my pocket that 15 years ago would have cost 10 to $12 million, assuming the technology had existed. I don't know why I have this amazing piece of equipment in my pocket, but this is what, in, in a free market, this is what market actors do. They, they discover unmet needs and well exceed them. If they can put a supercomputer in my pocket, they can't get me health care. There's something wrong with the Republicans' argument. Why? Why, why repeal and replace? Why not repeal? And so it's this, it's this idea, from what I understand, you, you believe in letting the markets regulate themselves which is a very traditional, I think, economic standpoint. Yeah, um, I, I think people left alone do amazing things. And, and you, you know, so often, believe me, the book's not wholly about healthcare. There's only about one or two chapters that go over it. But uh, think about another deeply held conservative view on healthcare. Okay, the Democrats 
completely ridiculous. Let, let's just get that out of the way. They quite literally think they can bend the cost curve downward, that they can decree healthcare cheap. No, if you want something to be cheap, let prices rise. That is the signal to entrepreneurs that there's lots of money to be made making what's very expensive, basically democratizing access to it very inexpensively. And so Democrats, let's, okay, they're hopeless on health care. But Republicans can't quite seem to get, wrap their heads around what you and I were discussing pre-show about how the free markets are very democratic and, and they're, they're constantly solving things. You articulated it better than I. And so they came up with, they've come up with health savings accounts. Okay, we're going to empower you people to spend your own money on health care. Wait, so Republicans are for the federal government writing a law that tells us that we can spend our money? What, what's wrong with that picture? Furthermore, I'm not sure a health savings account is what I want or what that the outcome should be. I don't know that it's not, but see, I was never demanding Amazon before it existed. I most certainly was never demanding Uber. Uber was a total revelation. Oh wait, they can use the smartphone to do that. And so the idea that conservatives know the way to give the voters money so that they can get the health care they want. No, no, no. How about just do nothing for a change? Well, this is this is an interesting point. So we were talking actually he's a, he's a Von Mises fan like myself. <laughs> talking about so we were talking about Ludwig von Mises and I understand you quote him a lot in your book too. Yes. Um, but that was one of his big points, is that the market itself is a democratic system. In other words, you vote with your, and it sounds, it sounds, it sounds out, overused, right? You vote with your dollar, but you really do. If, if, the, if a company is charging too much, a comp, another guy can come in and say, there is demand for lower cost. How can I provide it? If they're overcharging, does that mean I can provide it at a lower cost? Suddenly the market regulates itself, and suddenly this new competition comes in, and the guy charging too much, needs to compete with this guy who's providing a better service or decent service at a way lower cost. And then you see what people want. People want this expensive one, they want the cheap one. Can you compete with the cheap one with better services? Right? That, that's how the market regulates, right? Without question it does. And, and high prices in particular are the greatest outcome you could ever hope for in a market. One of the things I talk about in my last two books, including this one, is that the rich aren't just crucial to progress because they have unspent wealth that enables investment in new ideas. I mean, that's the greatest gift they bring to mankind is when they limit their taxes, when their taxes less, tax less, short of stuffing their wealth under a mattress, they have to invest it. And from the investment comes all sorts of experimentation on the way to amazing things. Uh, but the rich also do something that I would say our side doesn't talk about enough. They're venture buyers they uniquely have the funds to try new things. And so they had the old mobile phones that were $4,000 that were brick size. They bought the original laser printers that cost $17,000. They, they always have things first. And that's what's so important. The rich establish in the marketplace, oh, this is a luxury, this has real uses. At which point entrepreneurs see high prices and say, I'm going to become a billionaire by making that very expensive product where I'm going to democratize access to it. I'm going to mass produce what is presently a luxury for the rich. And so when you have this untaxed wealth, the most stimulative tax of all, and it's a point I make in the book, is a tax cut for the rich because they invest it most prominently, most importantly, but they also spend it. And they set the stage for the progress that you, that uh, someone like me, I can't set the stage. I can't, I don't have enough money to move the needle in terms of investment or in terms of consumption. Yeah, this, this is a really interesting point. And honestly, it's something I haven't really thought of before. The idea that allowing the rich to, allowing people to become rich in the first place, which <laughs> some people are so extremely these days that they don't even want that. But the idea that people with money buying luxury goods is what allows those frontier technologies and frontier luxury goods to exist in the market. And seeing the demand for that encourages entrepreneurs to provide those same luxury goods at lower costs. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting concept. Absolutely, since, since we both love Von Mises so much, he put it that luxury is an historical concept in that the rich, again, uniquely, they, they see something, they want to be unique, they buy it, they've got the money to buy these things that most of us can't imagine owning, 
And that is the signal to the entrepreneur, your path to wealth is mass producing what only the rich own. And so what I always remind people um, is, okay, it be, this happened with cell phones, it happened with automobiles. Remember, it used to be that if you had a car, you were extraordinarily rich, you were, you were the source of awe. Oh my, this person has an automobile. So Henry Ford mass produced it. And what's exciting to me about this, and, and let's, just, let's just agree, it's going to happen. I'm guessing it's going to happen within 10 to 15 years. How old is your daughter? 10 or she's, nine, sorry. She's nine and so guaranteed by the time she's in college, this is going to be, if she goes, if we, des, if we decide uh -huh. that you allow her to go because we, we're skeptical about education, your daughter will be flying on private jets. And why do we know that? Because the rich fly on private jets now and what they enjoy, what they love, what they cannot live without is always and everywhere a menu into our future, what we'll all enjoy. Private flight is going to be a very common thing in not too distant future. We see it already happening in New York. There's this new company doing these private helicopter flights between Washington and New York. Mm -hmm. Too expensive for guys like me to afford at the, the current time, but the, the mere existence of that could allow for what you're talking about. Without question, because it's, it's, it's a convenience, it's a luxury. Who among us wouldn't love to not have to go to the airport and deal with some of the difficulties there, but just go to a private plane and get on it? And so this is, this is exactly what entrepreneurs need. They've got the signal. They know that th these things work. The cost of planes continues to drop thanks to investment from rich people willing to lose money on intriguing ideas. Uh, which then leads us to the, the outcome that your daughter, by the time she's in her 20s, is going to view private flight as something that's pretty ho-hum. Well, I can tell you, 20 years ago, me and my, I, I couldn't imagine half the technologies we have today. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine having a smartphone like I do today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I remember my old 16 megabyte RAM computer was like cutting edge back when I was a kid. Totally. Well, we're both from California, and, and so one of my favorite stories about this is uh, so every Christmas Eve, my father, sister, and I would go shopping for, for my mom. And so one Christmas Eve, this was 1989, I'm probably aging myself, um, we're in Beverly Hills shopping for, for my mother. And uh, I look over in the parking lot and I see this guy on one of these massive phones. And the reaction is, ah, oh my God. And so I'm inching close, okay, who is it, who is it? It's gotta be a famous movie star producer because that's all the, those are the only people who had them. Think about what a novelty, even in the 1990s, a car phone was. Uh, that book, Thank You for Smoking by Christopher Buckley, the running joke in it was that he, one of the characters goes out to Los Angeles and people have, the, the, all the rich, showy Hollywood types have car phones, those primitive ones with, with, the, with the antennas those, those, those on the back. Those were a big deal back in the day for those who don't remember. A huge <laughs> deal that, that yeah. no one had. And so remember back in the day that people would quite literally install in their cars fake antennas to make it look like they had a car phone. And so, of course, now they're so common anywhere you look, people are t tapping down on the supercomputers that sit in their pocket. And well, and we saw we saw the market develop into that as well. We, we, we first saw the pager as being the, the device similar to that that everyone could afford. Mm -hmm. that, and that was the first subscription service for that and so on that eventually led into what we know is the, you know, the cell phone companies providing that service. Mm -hmm really remarkable how this works and it's all a function of capital being matched with talent and that's one of the frequent themes of this book is that when you think about it both sides have zero interest in reducing government spending now let me be clear the book does not make an argument about budget deficits as in they're bad or good I don't even think about them the only thing that I concentrate on are the amount of dollars the federal government spends because that represents these precious resources that are being extracted from the economy. It's not dollars being extracted from the economy. It's trucks, tractors, computers, desks, chairs, most crucially of all labor that is being taken from market directed uses and being directed in non-market ways by those armed with wealth in government that was taken from the private sector. And so you look at it in the, the extreme level. Uh, the Congo used to be one of Africa's more prosperous nations. And then the government came in in the 1960s and basically took businesses from their owners and tried to run them. 
and failed predictably. It's hard to run a business on your best day when you don't understand the business you're going to fail. The point I'm making here is that it's no different from what our government does now, five trillion in spending a year. That's a lot of trucks, tractors, computers, desks, chairs, and labor being extracted from the economy and run improperly by those who lack market discipline. And so what are we losing? We're easily the richest country on earth. It's staggering all the innovation. But what have we missed out on? Because so much of our wealth is being extracted on an annual basis. And you hit on a few interesting points. One, one is the idea of having, say, localized economies, not a massive state bureaucracy trying to run everything and mi micromanaging everything, which, you, which doesn't work. We've seen it over and over again over the course of history. It's never worked. Trying to, trying to micromanage every, every industry from the top. And at the same time, when you allow the markets to work, you do have failure. And of course, I, I mean, not just Mises, but other people as well have pointed out that it's that, you'll find it a lot, for, I'll step back, you'll find it a lot with very wealthy people that they've failed multiple times before they finally broke through and became wealthy. Because when you fail, you find out what didn't work. You find out what the market didn't want. You find out you know, what you did wrong and how to fix it. And so allowing people to fail allows them to be get a better feel of the market. Whereas when you deal with state subsidies, when you're dealing with the government intervening and subsidizing an industry, you have a failing product that is institutionalized like Obamacare, for example, right? No question, I, could, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, what you're describing is a major theme of my book, is that the failure is the progress. And that's why I don't fear when people say, and we discussed it pre-show about, well, these state subsidized enterprises in China, to the extent that they exist, that weakens them, that does not strengthen them for all the reasons you say, the best businesses in the United States, they're the best because they constantly rush to their errors. Uh, Pixar is a, is a business that's featured a lot and they're both wrong. And what does the founder Ked, Ed Catmull say in, in his autobiography? He says, all of our movies suck at first. We're constantly rushing to our errors. We're constantly trying to figure it, we're uncomfortable when the production of a movie is going very well because we feel we must be missing some monumental error that we're committing. And so we're always trying to find this out, what are we doing wrong? And so to read him, and, to, and you can see why we had the 1930s. If Ed Catmull had been running the United, if he'd been president in the 1930s, that would never have happened because all the 1930s were was a scenario whereby Democrats and Republicans said, okay, some mistakes were made and we're going to subsidize your ability to double down on those errors. We're going to subsidize your ability to not face up to the mistakes you made. And so as a consequence, by American standards, not by the rest of the world, we got stagnation. To the rest of the world, our, 19, our Great Depression was boom time, but in the US, we're used to greater things. And so why does capitalism work so well? Why is it so dangerous when both sides say, we're going to fight that recession, we're going to figure, we're, we're going to get the economy moving again, is the recession is the sign of an economy growing, an economy fixing itself, of the individuals and then the economy correcting their mistakes on the way to growth. And so both sides are so wrong in believing they should fight downturns. No, downturns are the recovery. That, that's an interesting perspective too, and I think we saw. I think the danger is when they try to bail out irresponsible companies, like the Obama administration did. At least in my opinion, because then when you when you bail them out, you rescue them from their mistakes. You should let let them feel the pain, let them fix their problems, let them never do it again. Mm -hmm. no my, in my opinion, you no, know, it's your opinion's perfectly valid. I would just I make the argument in this book that most of the most egregious bailouts occurred under George W. Bush. Really? Um, well, you look, Bear Stearns is bailed out by, by, during the Bush administration. Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, General Motors was bailed out while Bush was still in office. And, and so 
in doing so, it's not as though Goldman Sachs was going to disappear. It was one of the most talent and is one of the most talent laden companies the world has ever seen. And it's a brilliant company. I think investment banking is the, one of the most noble professions on earth. It's one thing to come up with a business idea. It's quite another to find the capital and, and, and find the correct capital structure for a company to grow. Uh, but if you love investment banking, if you love Wall Street, then you must love failure. Because if you bail it out for all those reasons, you rob the businesses of, of all the information that comes from mistakes and learning from them and, and correcting those mistakes. And so, and, and so is it any surprise going back to 2008 that we had a quote crisis? Now my argument in the book is that there was nothing financial about it. It was a crisis of intervention. The failure of a business could never cause an economy to convulse like that in, in a massive recession. So if that were true, then Silicon Valley would be the most depressed place on earth because just about every startup in Silicon Valley fails. It's just a monument to endless failure. Detroit 100 years ago was the original Silicon Valley, constant failure of car companies. That can't cause a recession or a crisis. What can only cause a crisis is an intervention in it for the reasons we say, because it's government limiting the process whereby businesses improve by learning from their mistakes. Well, and then when they, when they intervene, they subsidize a product that others can't compete with. They shut down the innovations, the innovations that could have competed with it. I think we see this, for example, a good example again is Obamacare, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Look, you, you, health care before <laughs> Obamacare was expensive, but it, you could make it. You could pay, you know, really not much, a couple hundred you know, here and there. It, it, it didn't cost that much money. I mean, it was expensive still, but it didn't cost that much. But these days, you're going to pay for Obamacare. You're looking at like $1,500 a year, maybe even like 3000 a year, some way more than that, depending on how much you make. People can't afford it. And because, because that is the standard, everyone has to pay into it, all this, you're right, you, could, you like your plan, you can keep your plan, it was a total lie. Suddenly all those markets that could provide competitive prices and we're trying to compete with each other can no longer do it. All we're left with now is high price, high price health care. Uh, high price health care that is robbed of the price signals that maybe would bring it higher. We should again, we should rejoice when something's really expensive because market history is very clear that what's expensive will eventually be cheap if that, remark, if that market remains free. It's so interesting to go around the poorest neighborhoods in any city in the United States and in addition to cars, in addition to cable TV, you also see at the low end, you see those boxes and windows that represent window unit air conditioning. Now what's important that in the 1930s, the first ever air conditioner was created for an heir in Minneapolis, a very rich heir by the name of Bill Gates, not the same one. The original window unit air conditioners, if you can imagine this in the 1930s, cost anywhere from ten to fifty thousand dollars, five oh. And so again, it's one of these things that you only the richest of the rich would ever even think of, have, of owning this window unit, which didn't cool things very well. Well, now they're everywhere. You can get a window unit air conditioner on Amazon for $100. Uh, again, uh, the first laser printer cost $17,000. In the late 90s, the top of the line Tandy desktop computer cost $9,800. It was a fraction of as, as fast as what we have. Um, mouse was not included, nor was monitor included for this $9,800 contraption. Certainly not printer or anything like that. Um, this was the kind of computer that you wouldn't touch today. But back then, boy, you're going to pay a pretty penny for it. What do capitalists keep doing? They see high prices and they make them low. Well, and it's interesting too, as you described earlier, that that could not have happened were it not for wealthy pe you know, people who made enough money to be able to buy those things, which in their own right helped, helped finance. It was almost like an investment that helped finance the creation of the lower, of the lower priced products. Absolutely. It's so important what you say is that it's the, the rich invest and create amazing jobs. Their investment is the source of job creation. Their investment is the source of progress because they try the new things. They, they've got the money to lose on new ideas. They're venture buyers. And to your point, you put it better than I, 
as venture buyers, they're subsidizing our lifestyles because they're taking all the risks on drugs, on, on, on appliances, on, on gadgetry, that if it proves valuable, we know that's what we're going to get. It's an amazing thing. Great. So, John, where can people find your book? And again, that's They're Both Wrong, a policy guide for America's frustrated independent thinkers. Well, you can go on Amazon, among <laughs> other things. Uh, Speaking of capitalism. Ca yeah, great. Ca <laughs> Amazon is a frequent theme in the book. Uh, all the all the innovation, all the risk taking, all all the intrepid ways of Amazon. That's a frequent theme in the book. Jeff Bezos loves successful products like the Alexa, because it gives him the money to experiment in all sorts of other ways, in ways to please us. And, and so, yes, you can find this on Amazon in hardback, softback, uh, uh, on Kindle too, and. Uh, Again, hopefully it will open your eyes. It, there's, there's no charts or graphs or equations. What's in the book is just stories about people uh, succeeding from sports to business uh, with all this leading to an economic lesson within. There's nothing difficult to understand. It's all pretty basic. I guess just as a closing question, if you were to sum up the message you want to get across with this book, why you wrote it in the first place, what you want people to take home from it, what would you, what would you tell them? Uh, probably the main thing is, is if people are fallible in the business world, and they are, imagine how egregious their mistakes are going to be in the policy world. And so that's the main thing. I show why so much of what we assume as being true on both sides is easy to disprove to make the broader point that these guys who claim, who promise you the moon, are exponentially more fallible than people in business than the smartest business people in the world who freely admit they fail all the time. So if they do, are you really going to trust your politicians when they promise you great things? Uh, be smarter than that and demand more of them. Great. Hey, John, real pleasure having you on Thank you so much, Josh. Appreciate Thank you. it. Great. And everyone, please remember to like and subscribe. See you next time.